My name is Arlisha Yetzer, and I'm a watercolor artist who also makes art-related videos on YouTube. I love making art because as an adult, I found so much liberation in the idea that it's a skill that you can learn. Growing up, I'd always been told that it was like some amazing talent that you either had or you didn't have. And as I got older, I learned that anyone can do it. I find myself most inspired by the vulnerability that we all share as humans and distilling and capturing those singular emotions is something that I love to strive for in my art. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kathleen, and I'm with Etcher, your studio host for today. And for those who are new with Etcher, we are an art learning platform who works with art teachers from all across the globe. And today's free demo is brought to you by Arlisha Yetzer. And Hi, this works. Hi. <laughs> all right. And this works as a preview for her 90 minute class which will be on June 9, that's 2 p.m. Eastern time. And that's already available on our website. In case you're curious, I'll be dropping that link in the chat. And um, I'll go ahead and let Arlisha talk about the main class later. So before we begin, if you have questions for Arlisha, just type them in all capital letters. We'll be willing to answer all of your questions and if it's related to what she's doing um, at the moment. If not, we'll go ahead and answer them for, in our Q&A. And we also have a private Facebook group open to anyone making art um, related to both our free content and paid classes. So if you plan to follow along today, I'll be posting several links in the chat, which you might find useful. Um, and you might want to search for Etra Studio Fam on Facebook. So you might want to post your work there too. So with that said, Arlisha, can you let us know what you'll be doing today and how that connects to your Etra class? Hey everyone. So today we are going to be going through the painting process of an eye in watercolor. So we're going to start with just outlining how I usually construct the eye. We'll sketch and then we will paint. And we're going to be using a limited palette of just three colors. Awesome. All right. Let me just show that right here. Okay. Do you want to talk about this? Um, sure. Real quickly? Okay. Yeah. So the first image that you saw was the eye that we are painting today. And mm -hmm. the second image here is the full portrait that we'll be doing for the 90 minute class. So today we're going to be focusing on just one eye. And then on June 9th for the 90 minute class, we're gonna go through a whole portrait and we'll have like a reference images and thumbnailing and all that stuff. And then after that, we are, or rather the other images you're seeing here are just some more examples of like eyes that I've painted in the past. Sometimes they're like just in a sketchbook. Sometimes they're like really short, quick sketches and sometimes they're a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So for today, the supplies that I'm going to be using, I have some hot press paper by Winsor & Newton. I'm using just two brushes. These are both silver black velvet brushes. I have a size 8 and a size 14. The pencil I'm using is by Blackwing. I think it's just like a normal HB pencil. It was sent to me as a gift. So anything like in the normal HB range is good. You don't want anything too soft because the lines get really dark. And then the three colors we're using are lemon yellow, a cool red, which is ruby red by Winsor and Newton, and the blue is bright blue by Win or sorry by White Knights. All three of these paints are from my White Knights palette. So for the eye itself, I'm going to show you using the actual reference image how I usually go about like constructing the eye. And usually I focus first on like the overall structure of the eye socket. So I'll do two lines across the top for the top of the brow bone. And usually I'll do a, a longer line and then a shorter one. And that will be our brow bone. A line curving in towards the inner corner of the eye, a line curving in towards the outer corner and then circling around the outside of the eye socket. And this is like the general shape that I use for all of my eyes. It'll vary depending on like the type of eye you're drawing. Every eye is a little bit different, but I usually follow these basic guidelines, keeping in mind that there is like an eyeball inside of here. And then we have lots of skin folding around the eyeball. 
So for this particular eye, the, the eye is like very hooded and it might also be affected by the angle. So like there's a very sharp angle of like that top lid of the eye and then curves around like that bottom crease. You can see how it curves around like the spherical shape of the eyeball. And a really interesting thing when we get to painting this one is going to be the fact that the entirety of like the iris and the white of the eye is all in shadow, which I think is really interesting. So it's going to be a fun exercise in like knocking out all of that white. So for sketching, we're going to follow like those same guidelines that just that we just went over. I'm going to sketch a little bit darker than I normally would when I'm planning to like paint a sketch. And that's just for visibility. Normally I try to keep my sketches pretty light. So I will be making like this structure a little bit darker than usual so you can see it. Again, following those same rules, we'll do two lines across the top for the brow bone and then the shape will curve down around the eye socket. I usually like to use a combination of straight lines and curved lines, I find that this gives like a really nice organic shape and also just creates more interesting shapes. If everything is too straight or too round, it, it just doesn't look as appealing like when you have the overall shape completed. Something that I'm doing right here that I'm actually gonna end up changing later on, you'll see I kind of was just following, okay, this is what I know about how an eye works. I put the brow bone at the top and then came down to draw the actual eye shape. And you can see the reference image down in the corner there. You may even be able to tell at this point what it was that I ended up making a change about. And it was just that as I was sketching in the shape, I realized that I didn't like the space between the eye itself and the eyebrow. So I ended up moving the eyebrow down to better represent what I was seeing in the reference image, which is the fact that the eyebrow itself is actually really close to like the eyelids and the eye. And making note of how those relationships vary is really, really important because that's what's going to help the different eyes that you draw to look different from one another. I remember early on, it was really easy for me to like make everything kind of look the same because I wasn't paying an, like enough attention to reference images or wasn't using them. So what I'm sketching now with this actual eye, I really like how kind of long the overall eye shape is. We can see like the roundness, the curve of the eyeball, which is really interesting, but overall the shape itself, the eye is a bit squinted. And I think the combination of the squinting eye and the fact that everything is kind of in shadow creates like this sort of intense stare, but also we don't have like a bright highlight on the eyes. So it's like a slightly hazy, intense stare. And those are the sorts of things I'm thinking about while I'm sketching and while I'm adding everything in at this point. And it helps me to get a better idea for the overall like emotion and feeling of the painting, even though this is a quick one. Um, just thinking about those things while I'm sketching is really helpful. So at this point, the eye looks pretty good. It looks pretty standard. And here we go. I was, I was really tempted to just leave it the way it was, but I knew that taking the time to make this little adjustment would be worth it in in the long run. And it's funny because sometimes when you're when you're sketching from reference, you can feel like things look a little bit off, but you're not exactly sure why. Um, yeah. So sometimes like making little adjustments like this and just looking at the measurements going like, you know, do these different shapes line up the way I see them in the reference can like make all the difference. And I was much happier after I use after I moved the eyebrow down. I think I moved it quite a lot, too. So the last step before painting, I have a kneaded eraser here. I think this one is by Faber-Castell. And my, need, my needed eraser gets a lot of abuse. I really like them to erase sketches that I'm going to paint on because as you can see, I'm just kind of like dabbing it on my pencil marks so that I can lighten my sketch without damaging the paper. So I really like, um, I, I really like using, I was just reading the question about how do I keep myself from dipping brush in my coffee? Uh. <laughs> I, just, I think usually hope for the best. That's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's usually a common problem especially for um, watercolor yeah. artists I guess mm -hmm. or they need right. to be like on very wide opposite sides of the table 
<laughs> yeah, so we're moving into painting now. I decided for this one, I wanted to keep the colors kind of analogous, so close to each other. I don't want to have a ton of variance in the overall color theme. I want it to really work together. So I'm going to be focusing on a lot of warm colors for this one. Again, I'm using just red, yellow, and blue for my color palette. So, and you're also going to see that I'm mostly mixing my colors all from the same place. So, um, like that one well in my palette, it's like all going to be from that one space. And I'm starting by just knocking back a lot of the white of the paper. It, it may look really dark now, the shapes I'm putting in now, but that's just because we're only able to compare it to the white of the page. Once I start to, well, once this layer dries and also once I start to layer on top, you'll see that this initial layer is not that dark. I also like to take this opportunity to work a lot wet into wet. So while that first layer is still wet, I will start dropping in other colors, like slight variances. So I have my purpley color and then um, I will like just drop shifts in color. So add a little bit more red and drop that in. Or if I want the, the color to be um, a little bit cooler, I'll add a little bit more blue. And I like being able to do subtle shifts in color from that spot. Yep, and there you can see I added a little bit of blue just to the corner of my mix. Oh, it turned into a lot of blue. <laughs> so I wanted the color to be a bit cooler. And I, I really like to mix like from one central spot. And this is actually really nice. And one of my favorite things to do in painting eyes is the fact that the white of the eye is usually not white, like white, white. So knocking out the white of the page, I think ultimately just leads to a more realistic looking eye. I also, I also will do a lot of, like, I'll start with less saturated colors, which may seem a little silly because these colors aren't like super desaturated, but I usually start with less saturated colors. And then once I've got that first, like light blocking in of color, I will add a little bit more saturation to my mix and then also let the color get a bit darker. So this is where you can really start to see that the initial layer I put down, while it may have initially looked dark, it, or it actually is much, much lighter than the mix we're putting in now. And I kind of worked in circles around the painting as some of the area started to dry. Um, if I wanted it to be wet and wet, I would go back into that area right away. But if I wanted to start layering, I would let that section dry and work on something else before coming back to a particular area. At this point, I was going for a much, much darker tone. I think it's really helpful early on to establish a darker value. It helps to see the full range. So we've got the white of the page, and then I'm laying in the eyebrow. So having the combination of the white of the page and a darker value being the eyebrow helps me to then just fill in the gaps with everything else. So I've got a light value, I've got a dark value, and then I can just work on putting everything else in between. You can see that I got a little scared about like a decision I'd already made about the eyebrow. And when I started painting it, I actually put it up a bit higher. And by the time we get to the end of the painting, that will be lower, which is nice because when I work loose like this, it's okay to shift the layers because it really just, I think, adds character to it. So instead of going, I repainted the eyebrow in a lower spot, ultimately, I think that it just lends to that sort of surreal atmosphere, having like the eyebrows kind of layer on top of each other. I also think it's really important to have a color exist in more than one place. So that color I use for the eyebrow, I'm also using for like the depths of the creases of the eyelid, as well as like the shadow that's cast from the eyelid down onto the eyeball itself. And by using that color in more than one place, it helps the color palette to be more harmonious and just work together. Mixing browns in watercolor is actually really fun. Just a reminder that I, I don't have any brown in this limited palette. So, um, I really like to mix my own browns. I think that you get a lot of 
variety, like especially when I'm working wet into wet, the colors kind of separate from each other a little bit. I like that a lot. And then I can very easily control the temperature of my browns uh, when I mix them myself. So that's fun. An important thing up to this point is that I haven't dried my painting at all. So while some of the like super light areas are mostly dry at this point, I am doing a lot of wet onto wet because there is just a large area of the paper that is still wet. And you can only do that for so long while I still want things to blend together. Um, you know, I can, I can work wet onto wet, but eventually I will have to either wait for this to dry or let it dry on its own. I see now what you mean by the whites not being completely white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you re usually want to reserve like completely white for highlights. Otherwise, things can look a bit too washed out if there's too much white or if, like if you overuse the white. So it's still a really light value, the white of the eye, but it's not, um, you know, it's not like super white and it's not super dark. So I think it works together. So just now I brought out my heat tool. It's actually like an embossing tool. And I <laughs> love an embossing tool for drying my layers. It's really quick. It focuses more on putting out heat than putting out air, which means that I can quickly dry my painting without moving the paint around like you might experience more with like a hair dryer that would like be more pressure. So now that first the first like layers that we did are completely dry now. So I'm able to go in and this is the point where I've got a lot of my basic color groups down. So the areas that are really warm are pretty much in. The areas that I want to be lighter are down. And now it's time to, if you think about it like a sculpture, you know, we had a ball of clay and we started carving out like the big shapes. And now we've got like a vague shape. And this part where we're putting in our darker values is like where we're really gonna start to carve in the details and everything's gonna kind of come together. But we needed those really loose layers in the beginning to set the atmosphere. Cause looseness in a painting is something that I find is much more difficult to try to add after the fact. And I think it's when I can start on a, like a loose, wet, watery base and then just build just enough structure into that, I find that to be really effective. So now yeah. I'm just, Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, we've got a couple of questions piling up for our Q&A. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Um, Do we want to yeah, save well, those for the end or? Some of them, yes. Um, but you can go ahead and um, do your quick demo. Okay, sure. Yeah, we'll get, we'll, we'll work through this then. And if there are any like pressing questions, feel free to just cut me off. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm looking at my my reference and one thing I think is really useful is to like kind of squint at it and it helps to see the value groups better so um, I, I am actually squinting at it right now even though there's not really any point for it but I if I squint at it I can kind of see the grouping together of the shadow shape and how the darkness of the eyebrow flows into like the depth of the eye socket which kind of flows into the eyelids and the iris and then flows back around the other side of the eye like the outer side so grouping together larger shadow shapes is 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 really really helpful i find that if you focus on good values you can kind of do whatever you want with color like as long as my values are good, like if I can take a picture of my painting and put it in grayscale and tell what it is, then you can pretty much use any colors you want. If you can kind of tell from my mixing palette, like where I'm mixing my colors, that my colors are much more saturated than they were when we first started. The colors in the beginning were very watered down and the colors were mixed together a lot so they weren't as saturated. But now I'm going in with closer to like just straight saturated color to get like those darker values in. And on some occasions I will like lighten the small section of my mixing if I find that I need those lighter tones, but it's really nice being able to use the same colors. So that crease of the eyelid and the small like light layers that I'm adding in now to better define the values are the same color it's just like a watered down version of the same color. 
I really like being able to just do subtle shifts in hue this way, like working out of one mixing well. So just now I added just a little bit of blue to the mix I already had so that I could paint in the cast shadow, like the shadow that the eyelids cast onto the white of the eye, which isn't like a super clean line in the reference image. It's kind of hazy and all of it's in shadow. I decided to do it a little tiny bit more clean cut. I think it just adds a little bit of drama. So sometimes you do like little interpretive things where you vary from the reference a little bit. One of my favorite things about this little painting is that when I was painting in the iris in that first layer, I dropped a little bit of water into the iris, which caused like a little bit of a cauliflower effect where the water blooms in the wet paint and creates more texture. And I really like that. And especially using hot pressed or hot pressed papers, I think that's more prominent with um, those types of papers, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I love cold press paper. It's great. It's really fantastic for like even washes. But with a hot press paper like this, all of the texture shows. So every little brush stroke, every little edge is visible. It's definitely my favorite, especially for techniques like this. Gotcha. So you can oh. see here that, oh, go ahead. Oh no, um, someone was asking, am I the only one who doesn't squint? I just wear my eyes or use my side vision. Uh, oh, like that's interesting, vision. yeah. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Oh, I really, I'll have to give that a try, like in the future to just try like looking at something like out of the corner of my eye and seeing how that works. Sometimes I'll even just stand up and like walk away from the painting just to see it from further away. Yeah, That's helpful. So yeah, you can see like now that the eyebrow is lower than it was before. And because <laughs> I just went in with a second layer, but because we have lots of layers and that's just that sort of chunky technique that I like to use, it's not too off-putting to have those things separate. And then I did some very light eyelashes and I try to remember that because we have so much folding of the eyelid that the eyelashes are gonna be largely obscured and just a little bit for texture. It's kind of crazy that that's it like that it, you know it was wow. like a 20 a 20 minute process and uh with you know give or take like a minute in the middle where i dried the painting you know um but yeah. that's it it comes together pretty quickly amazing all right let me just go ahead and go through some questions um which we've left in the chat but if you guys have any questions as well uh, feel free to type them here Meanwhile, I'll go back to, oh, before we go back to some of the questions, by the way, um, hello to our newcomers. So um, Alicia will be having a 90 minute class. Um, this is just a preview for the main class, which will, she will be having on our website at your studio. I'll go ahead and drop that link later in the chat. So um, the 90 minute class is a step-by-step -step process, which will be um, great for you guys to follow along. And like this one, this is, um, someone noticed that this is a pre-recorded um, video, but we are definitely live. <laughs> We're with you guys. Um, so yeah, you guys can definitely follow along there. So Alicia, would you do the honors to pretty much talk about what you will be doing in the 90 minute class? Mm -hmm. So this class was pretty straightforward. We sketched, we paint, or this demo was, you know, we sketched, we painted, and, and that was pretty quick. The 90 minute class is going to, going to, is going to be more of like outlining the whole portrait painting process. So we'll start with looking at our reference image, kind of like we did here, and we will analyze that. And then we're going to do some thumbnail sketching, which is really helpful for establishing values. So we're just going to have just a pencil and like a tiny little thumbnail sketch, and we'll do that. And then we will sketch and paint, and we're going to be focusing on all of the face now. So rendering out each individual um, like section of the face, and we'll do I'll talk also about my technique for how I like to render hair in like a loose watercolor way so that it's like, yes, that's absolutely hair, but we don't have to get distracted by like every strand. I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, oh, which, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> so, which brings me uh, about your certain, you've got like this unique technique, which brings me to one of these questions from Alexis. How did you learn to color this way? I love the effect that it has. 
Oh, thank you so much. I, I've said this before, kind of jokingly, but it's also true. I started using lots of different colors, which is more apparent in this in this painting, actually by accident, because I was having so much trouble like mixing natural skin tones. And also I I kind of got I don't want to say bored of it quickly because there's still so much beauty in natural skin tones, but I took those tiny variances that you see in skin and just like magnified them and, and did a lot more of it. So it was definitely a slow overtime thing. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was learning that values are the most important thing. And, you know, if you can look at the painting in black and white and you can tell what it is, then it allows a lot of freedom as far as like working with different colors things. So it was a slow thing over time um, and mostly experimenting with like small limited palettes of like two or three colors. Gotcha, all right. Uh, all right, let's go back to some of the questions, earlier questions. Um, is there a type of lighting that's best when looking for references for beginners? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. So when you look at pictures, especially online, like I use Pinterest a lot. So there's going to be lots of like pictures of models and people who look really fancy. The problem with some of those is that the lighting is really ambient. So like I have light coming through my window. It's like coming at this direction right now, but my face is pretty well lit. And I actually don't really recommend that for beginners because there aren't a lot of cast shadows. So you can tell that this side of my face is darker than this side. But if you're looking for good references for beginners, I would recommend looking at pictures of sculptures because those are always lit really dramatically. And it's really it's a really good way to see lighting and to see how light falls differently on the face. So look for more dramatic lighting would be my my primary piece of advice. That's really helpful. I haven't really thought of um, using sculptures. Um, as references, but I guess it's something we can try. Um, all right. So Marilyn has a question about how do you know where to start the eyelashes? Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. <laughs> I've had like a long, painful journey with eyelashes for a couple of years, probably. I just avoided them because I felt like whenever I did them, they didn't look natural. Um, I would say if less is more with eyelashes. So if you're looking at the painting I did here, obviously a, an actual person has way more eyelashes than this but really what we want to do is imply the texture of eyelashes instead of trying to put in every hair so i try to think about like if this is the um the eyelid from the side like that the eyelash curves up around like it's not just sticking straight out this way or even up this way it kind of starts underneath and curves up around like this, <laughs> if that's helpful. I'll just keep doing this motion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's really helpful to remember that you're you're kind of observing the eyelashes in 3D space. So they're going to curve up and around the eyelid. And I think that's really helpful. So sometimes when you're, especially when you're seeing the eyelash straight from, from straight ahead, it's not going to curve one direction or the other, but it might go straight ahead. And so, yeah, it's helpful just to remember that it's 3D and it's a curved shape, like a C shape. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we've got some two questions that are kind of related to each other. So let's go through them. Um, first is, have you ever tried the Zorn palette, black, red, yellow, as a limited palette? If so, what did you think of it? And then second is, what are you using for the brand um, of Faint now? I am in Poland and I want to buy a Roman Um I'm not sure if this was spelled incorrectly. No, um, yeah, Roman have... small watercolors. Yeah. Oh, sure. All right. That, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And All of right. course, we can just assume that we're kind of pronouncing it incorrectly because right. <laughs> we're not Polish, but that's okay. Yeah, I know. I, I know what you mean. Gotcha. And I have good primaries, but maybe you can recommend some color. So I think this, okay. these two would go along. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm sorry. What was the, the first part of the question? I'm sorry. Let me actually go back. No worries. Oh, the Zorn um, palette. Right. Okay. I see it now. Right. Right. Um, I have. I have tried the Zorn palette, um, black, red, yellow, um, which if you're not familiar, it was like coined by the artist um, Anders Zorn and he painted in oil paints. I have tried it. I actually have a video on my channel where I did the Zorn palette in gouache. So I don't do a ton of um, oil painting. I've done a little bit, but I do have like a limited palette video where I did that with gouache. It's really fun. I think it's the, the 
the like magical thing about that palette is that you don't have a um a blue so the black acts like a blue it's really really interesting like when you compare like those super it's usually like a cadmium red so it's like a really really warm red and when you compare that to like the black especially mixed with a little bit of titanium white it shifts a little bit blue and so yeah it's a fascinating palette and i would recommend it to anybody um as far as for today i used white knights watercolors which have been my favorite like until like the last year or two and now roman small watercolors are my favorite um i if you have access to jackson's art supplies they have like you can see everything there they have like all the colors and they're all swatched out so it's really helpful and if you're interested in looking at specific colors there are some other youtubers who have like swatched the whole range of 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 the brand (laughs) so yeah i would highly recommend them if you're looking for specific color recommendations and you've maybe already got the basics covered like you've got like nice primary colors maybe even like split primaries where you've got a warm and cool of those if you've already done that i would recommend they have some really nice granulating neutral colors So like neutral tint sort of things where it's colors mixed with blues that will granulate or browns that will granulate. And they're really, really pretty. Lots of texture. Amazing. All right. But just um, imagining how you would do like the swatch of the whole palette for that. Like it's it's really a great effort. (laughs) Uh, Oh, it is. Yeah. People. Yeah. People really they really put in a lot of effort with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, take their time. I, I couldn't spend like less of a time minute with um doing swatches. Like, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. But um, okay, another question. Um, I guess this one's kind of like a really just a chill question. Who mm-hmm. are your favorite watercolor artists? <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. It's also really hard for me when answering this question not to just pick my friends because <laughs> It's people, other artists who are online right now, um, who I'm blessed enough to to consider to be my friends, like Miriam Tilson. She also has a YouTube channel, and I'm in love with her work. Also, my friend Dory, Dory, why not? She is like, I ha- I basically have like a shrine to Dory in my studio, where it's just all of her art that I've like <laughs> slowly purchased over time. She does beautiful layering. Um, she's not on YouTube, but she's on Instagram. And I am in love with her techniques. Of course, there's there's like the classic, like the people that you find that make you love watercolors, like Tillith, who she hasn't been on YouTube for a while, but I love Tillith. And also like Agnes Cecile. And I think that's a good little group of people where I think if you looked at all of their work together, you could be like, I see how Alicia got to where she is now. Yeah. Yeah, all I right. love them. Well, we'll definitely check them out. And um, for, I guess for um those people who might have missed um these amazing artists and um you you maybe we could like do a story some sort of story in on instagram so that we could list them maybe yeah Um, absolutely (laughs) all right and i'll just read through some of these amazing comments right here um later but i'll go ahead and um go through the some of the questions first um do you have tips for not overworking a painting i tend to get lost in trying to blend the colors and quickly damage the paper Mm -hmm. yeah so my biggest tip for not overworking is to take like five minutes before you start to do like a thumbnail so you know where the values are going to go and even you can like even take that same thumbnail and throw some paint on it so if you have a little bit of an idea ahead of time where your darkest and lightest values are going to be and a rough idea of the color scheme that you want, it'll stop you from trying to think on the paper. For me, that's usually what leads to my paintings getting overworked is where I'm going, hmm, do I want this to be here while I'm thinking on the paper? And then it just leads to things getting overworked. That's for me, that's the biggest help. Gotcha. All right. Um, Let's see. I think we've answered most of our questions. Um. Let's see. Let me just read through some of these amazing comments. Um, Hi, everyone. I really admire the way you paint eyes. Alicia, very happy and grateful to see a demo dedicated to that subject, says Colleen. Um, Pierre says, I'm definitely about to find an embossing tool. That's such a great They're so handy. They're so handy. Mine's (laughs) a little melted (laughs) because, like, the cap was crooked at one point. So when I turned it on, they're very hot. So you do have to be careful with them. I have almost burned through like a painting because I just held it in one spot for a couple seconds too long it makes it sound a little more dangerous than it is but just be careful because they're hot but they're yeah they're great 
That's a great tip, I, I think, for um, especially for beginners. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and someone says, I love your video so much, Arlie. They are what keeps me going whenever I question myself with my path. Where do Thank you take you. inspiration from? <laughs> These are so heartwarming. <laughs> Everybody um, is so sweet, yeah. Definitely. Uh, where do you take inspiration from? Are there any art books you would recommend? Oh, that's a good question. There is a book... Oh gosh. Oh wow, that's so hard. I have it on my shelf and I'm trying to think of who the author is. Um, there's a book called Anatomy for the Artist, and then also the same author has one called Sketchbook for the Artist, which sound like very vague oh. terms. I think the artist's first name is Sarah. Um okay. I will I will try to I'll try to find Maybe. this. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Um, no pressure. And maybe we could try to um post them on our stories again if ever you yeah. have the time to post yeah like rec <laughs> yeah recommended art books so those are great um other art books that i find really inspiring are just like the art of like studio ghibli films so ah. i love i love those it's so in it's so inspiring to see how like hayao miyazaki plans and Ooh, yeah. of, of course there's just this is like ethereal like supernatural quality and it's just like combined with like a childlike wonder that i absolutely love about his work so that those things are both really inspiring great um all right i apparently i can't read through all of these amazing comments arlie you'll have to do the honors later no on. problem i've been um, kind of <laughs> glancing at some of them everybody's so kind i really appreciate it right uh i think we'll i'll just have to like read some of these last mm -hmm. few comments right here um omg uh Tillith and agnes cecile are also my favorite artists that yes. that feeling is kind of like super um, amazing like when your favorite artists would have like s the same preferences like yeah uh, so mm -hmm. I, I definitely feel you there girl. <laughs> yeah those, um, those artists were definitely the people who made me see watercolor as like something that could be magical absolutely well, and indira says um i've been wa wanting to buy one of your originals for ages now and i get one for christmas love your work so much <gasps> yay thank you i'm i'm so happy that you enjoy it and i can't tell you how much that support means to me packing originals is like the most precious part of my job like when i get to pack those up and send those out that means a lot to me great oh i think we've got one more final question um if your thumbnail is turning to be good uh final paintings are your um oh okay um maybe they're referring to the thumbnails being good enough to um as a paint or as a piece that they mm -hmm. don't really need to try again do you kind of like experience that I guess sometimes yeah sometimes I get really attached to thumbnails like I'll do a little tiny thumbnail sketch and I really really like it and then I'm worried that um the final painting won't be as good and sometimes I can flit in the sketch like there's something about a small loose sketch that you're that you don't treat as too precious and then when those turn out really nice it's nice there have actually been times where yeah. I would do a little thumbnail sketch that I thought I loved so much that I would just take the thumbnail scan it make it bigger in Photoshop and print it out and just like, like either sometimes I can print it right onto watercolor paper. And sometimes I would like print it and then like use a light box or something and go, I love this thumbnail. Yeah. I'm doing it exactly like this. <laughs> and basically just like using that tracing that same structure for the final painting. Oh my gosh, I, I have never tried that, but definitely can relate to being attached in a specific piece, <laughs> mm. even like for sketches as well. Um, all right. Okay, I think we don't have any questions so far. We've got some people sharing their thoughts. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for being th so enthusiastic right here. Um, okay, all right, um, everyone, I think our time is up. So I hope you enjoyed your time with Etra Studio, our Alicia. Thank you so much for your demonstration today. And we do these live demos a couple of times a week. So make sure to check out our um, YouTube platform um, to for more class previews like these. I'll go ahead and drop our um, some links rather later on in the chat. And if you love what you have watched today, um, go ahead and click the like button below and um, hit subscribe button for Alicia to show some support. And also you might want to check out our YouTube um, studio as well, which I've dropped the link in the chat. Um, and also, I'll be dropping a survey form because I think I've heard, um, I've not heard, I'm sorry, I've seen <laughs> um, a chat earlier saying, um, thank you, Etra, for having Alicia. We 
definitely um, would love to hear from you. So I'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat for our survey form and just let us know how amazing our Alicia has been today. And please tell us how did today there. And um, if you love watched it, um, what you have watched today, remember that this is just a preview of the main class on June 9. So make sure to show your support to Alicia there. Um, so we'll be waiting for you guys. And any final thoughts, Alicia, before we close the session? Um, well, of course, first, I want to say thank you to everybody for coming. This is like one of my favorite things when I get to answer people's questions in real time and we get to just chat about things. It's like one of the best ways for me to get to answer questions. Cause sometimes if it's like in a message, I don't always get to it right away, but this is like a really nice way to just casually chat and hang out. Right. And of course I'm super grateful to Etcher for, um, for, you know, this opportunity for doing this with me. And thank you so much to you, Kathleen, for those of you who don't know, it's like basically the middle of the night where Kathleen is. So <laughs> I really appreciate that she's here and that she's, uh, hanging out with us today. So this has been fantastic. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. And thank you. And I presume most of you guys are from all across the globe as well. So it must be from different, you guys for, would be from different time zones too. So um, thank you so much for the dedication too. All right. And thank you so much again, Arlie, for that lovely demonstration. And we'll see you guys um, in her 90 minute class. And until next time, Make more art, everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye for now. Bye, guys.